Thanks for joining us on the Cultured Meat and Future Food Show. This episode is sponsored by the Black & Veatch Next Gen Ag Team. Learn more about Black & Veatch at www.bv.com. We're excited to have Matt Gibson of New Culture on this episode. Matt grew up in New Zealand where he studied microbiology and genetics at the University of Auckland before co-founding New Culture, a venture-backed cell ag startup based in the Bay Area that's making cow cheese without the cow. I learned a lot on this episode and it was a pleasure catching up with Matt. Let's jump right in. Matt, I'd like to welcome you to the Future Food Show. Thanks, Alex, for having me. Matt, tell us a little bit about your background and how New Culture came to be. It's actually a pretty long story, so I'll try and cut it down. I'm originally from New Zealand, which you can probably tell by the accent. And I studied science at university. Very quickly realized I don't really have the disposition for doing lab work. Even though I love science overall, I was a pretty lazy student. And so that actually spurred me to launch this website where students could rate and review courses. And that was specifically for me to find easy electives to take outside of my core science courses. And, you know, as it turns out, that got pretty popular. So when I graduated with my BSc, I had the choice of either furthering my science or jumping into this website full time. And I chose the latter. And that was my first real entrepreneurial experience and really infected me with this passion for entrepreneurship. And so this was all happening. And at the same time, I started hearing about this crazy idea called Lab Grown Meat, which was brought into the mainstream by Mark Post Lab. And this was like an absolute revelation to me. It was clear that this was the only way to transition the world to eat more sustainably by not changing the actual product, but the source material. And so I was working on this website and then I started asking everyone, what's been done in New Zealand as it relates to lab grown meats, as it was called back then, because I just desperately wanted to be involved. It blended these three passions I now had, which is like science, entrepreneurship, and animal rights. And as it turns out, back in 2015, in New Zealand, the tiny little country at the bottom of the world, there was no one working on it. And I was emailing professors, I was emailing everyone I could, just heard nothing back. And the people that did reply back said, don't know anyone doing it here in New Zealand. So I really resigned myself to just hearing from the sidelines. I remember contacting Memphis Meats and signed up to be one of their army of supporters. And so I was doing things like that. And then fast forward a few years, and I'm part of this blockchain startup, which is a whole nother story. But I was always keeping an ultra close eye on the space, which was now called cellular agriculture. And I actually began to notice something quite striking. And that was that almost all venture capital and startups were focused on meat. There's no one really working on cellular agriculture for dairy, except one company, which was Perfect Day. And this was very puzzling to me because one thing about New Zealand is that we make a lot of milk and we make a lot of dairy products. It's our biggest export and our economy is essentially reliant on it. And by having an economy reliant on dairy and making a lot of dairy, you bear witness to the impacts that it has on the environment. New Zealand's got this very clean, green image, but in fact, half our rivers and lakes are actually unswimmable because of the effluent runoff because of dairy farming. So I knew there had to be much more work put into thinking about how we can make dairy more sustainable, how we can remove our reliance on animals for dairy products. And at this stage, I knew how to start and run a company. I knew the science and I knew the space really well. In 2017, 2018, I just said, I'm just going to do it. That was really what drove me to start New Culture. And when I did decide to start New Culture, I knew I had to achieve two key things to make it a successful company. One was to find an amazing co-founder. And the other one was to get into IndieBio. IndieBio even back then had this amazing reputation Companies like Memphis Meats, Clara Foods, Jaltor, they'd all gone through IndieBio. And I just knew that was a place to be. That was a place to, to really build the foundation of new culture. But before I could do that, I had to find a fantastic co-founder. And I actually remember contacting Benjamina from Higher Stakes. There was a Slack channel that the GFI started for people interested in this space and wanting to start a company. And, and she was on there and I messaged her and I said, hey, how do I find a really great scientific co-founder? I knew the science, but I didn't know enough to lead the science. And she said, essentially, just be a recruiter. Go on LinkedIn, just recruit people, interview people, reference people, and essentially be a recruiter. And so that's exactly what I did. I bought LinkedIn Premium. After work, I would, I would spend hours just 
finding people with the right backgrounds, the right expertise, contacting them, pitching them, interviewing them for those very few that responded back and did this for a long time until I eventually found my co-founder of New Culture, which is Enya. And she turned out to be one of the greatest co-founders anyone could ask for. So I was super, super lucky to find her. She did a PhD in synthetic biology at Cambridge University. She's also a data consultant. So she's just incredibly gifted and has been able to move New Culture very quickly since then. So we came together in late 2018. We knew we wanted to do something with dairy. We put our heads together for a few months thinking about how we can best pitch new culture to IndieBio. And we decided cheese should be the focus because dairy cheese is incredibly unsustainable. It's the third worst animal food product for greenhouse gas emissions, for example. And what makes dairy cheese even worse is that there's no real viable alternatives. If you've ever tried plant-based cheese, you know what I'm talking about. It's not anywhere near the point it has to be to switch any mainstream dairy consumer over to a more sustainable cheese. And that's a huge problem because just how unsustainable dairy cheese is. And long story short, we quickly discovered why plant-based cheeses don't work. It's because they don't contain dairy proteins, which give dairy cheese all its core properties. And there was a very bullish technology that was developing for food called precision fermentation, allowing you to make target animal proteins without the animal. Our pitch to Andy Bio was, hey, look, we're going to use precision fermentation to make our dairy proteins. We're going to use plant-based fats and plant-based sugars. And we're going to use this base to make delicious cheese. And we took this idea to Indie Bio and we we're very fortunate to get in. And that's really how new culture came to be. Wow, that's definitely a lot to unpack there and really a great origin story, especially going back to that website that you started. I think it shows that you are carrying that entrepreneurial drive through and through, which is exciting. So is there a chance that you guys might not have chosen cheese? Because I know you and your co-founder were interested in some sort of cellular agriculture technology. I know you ended up on cheese, but it could have been something else. Is that right? Absolutely. Absolutely. We hadn't decided on cheese when we first got together. And June from Indie Bio, who's the CSO at Indie Bio, she actually helped us a lot because when I had the idea for new culture and decided to really go for it in 2018, and it was just me, I was emailing June like probably too much, like once every few months. Like, hey, June, like, my name's Matt. I'm from New Zealand. I'm going to be working on this. And you know, every third or fourth email, she reply with some suggestions. And she really got me thinking about problem of cheese. And so she was really instrumental actually to helping Enya and I really focus and understand why cheese should be that first product we target, why cheese is such a problem and how cellular agriculture can be the solution that solves that problem. Wow, that's great. Yeah. And June is great. And pre-pandemic, there was always these great meetups at the Indie Bio office. So I'm really excited to get back to those. <laughs> likewise, likewise, hopefully soon. So going through Indie Bio, you had this great experience, but I want to ask you, how far have you come since Demo Day? And your team presented, how is the result of Demo Day? And I remember you had a proof of concept, like a sample or example, and the goal was to get this really stretchy, nice, at the time it was mozzarella cheese product. Is that still one of the main focuses? Yeah, absolutely. We had a Demo Day, when was that? That was June or July of 2019. And... Now, overall, Indie Bio is just a fantastic experience. I don't know what they do, what they put in the water or in the air. But you've been at Indie Bio, right? It's effectively a basement in an alleyway in the heart of San Francisco, but they make amazing things happen. So we really accomplished a lot in those four months. And you're right, on Demo Day, we had a proof of concept cheese that we served to people. And we were fortunate enough to already be well underway with our seed rounds by the time we got to Demo Day. So for us, the pitch at Demo Day was really like a closing event where we were bringing on the last few investors to fill the syndicate. And you're exactly right where our focus early on and still today is to make that pasta filata mozzarella cheese. That's the most consumed cheese in the US. That's the cheese that everyone wants an animal-free version of that actually works. They're not just a starch and coconut oil substitute that doesn't really melt and doesn't really stretch at all. And the key to making that happen, as I alluded to, is to have dairy proteins in your cheese, specifically casein proteins, which are the, the proteins that give cheese its functionality, especially mozzarella cheese. And so at Indie Bio, we validated that we could produce these casein proteins with microbes, but like any synthetic biology platform, it takes a long time to bring it together, to optimize it, to scale it up, to produce any sort of protein in amounts that are more than milligrams. You know, at Indie Bio, we're literally making milligrams of protein. Now, fortunately, since then, and especially last year, 
we've been able to move incredibly quickly. And that's really a testament to the team. I'm pretty privileged to be surrounded by amazing scientists. And the speed that we moved at last year, given the pandemic, was just astounding to see. And so if you think about two core areas that we work on, one is the ability to produce casein proteins in high amounts, right? In this realm of precision fermentation, a key cost driver is your ability to produce a lot of your target protein, which is a measurement called titer, effectively saying, here's how much of my target protein I can produce per sugar consumed or per volume of fermentation tank that I'm occupying. And we've been able to really drive that up massively, allowing us to bring costs down, but also to produce a lot of casein protein in-house that we can actually work with. Our food scientist team can turn into cheese. We can measure functionality. We can taste it. We can put it on a pizza, put it in a pizza oven, see how it bakes at various temperatures. So we're doing that as we speak. And we're making quite a lot of cheese. And the second key area within not just being able to produce a lot of casein protein, but You've got to be able to understand and replicate the biochemistry, you know, how that casein protein comes together to form the base of cheese. And this is really, we're talking about the biochemistry of milk. Casein proteins aren't found by themselves. They're found in these, I won't get into too much technical detail, but they're in these particles, these colloidal particles called casein micelles. And for us to make a beautiful cheese, for us to go through that traditional cheese making process, we really need to replicate or be able to hone in on the ability to make casein proteins and then turn them into these casein micelles and how they're naturally found in milk. And we've put a lot of work into that and really mastered that. We've made all sorts of casein micelles that are native like. Long story short, the cheese that you tried, what was it now, like one and a half years ago, was a proof of concept made with dairy proteins purified from cow's milk. The cheese that we're making today is with dairy proteins we're making with microbes. And hopefully in the coming months, you'll be able to see a lot more of it as we release videos and photos publicly. But it's just been a super exciting last 12 months for us. And we even bought a professional pizza oven, really testing our cheese in like very high temperature settings. So it's been a really exciting and pretty delicious last few months for us. If you need any lab assistance, uh, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> that sounds awesome. That's so cool. And that's what I was going to ask. I was going to say, when people think about mozzarella, they think about pizza. And so having that pizza oven, I think it just makes it like such a cool lab experience to think about, to imagine. Yeah. As it turns out, I was pretty ignorant as it relates to pizza. And maybe that's because I'm, I'm from New Zealand, which is we're not really renowned for our sort of our food in a way. But there's just tremendous amounts of different types of pizza, all cooked at different temperatures. Pizza is not just this, you know, when we think about pizza, it's not just putting something on a dough and and with some tomato sauce and putting it in the oven. There's a million ways to go around it. And your cheese has to be functional and be able to behave correctly in each setting. And so it's actually quite a fascinating and, and difficult thing to do to be able to optimize our cheese for all these different types of scenarios where it could be baked. So you mentioned precision fermentation, and we've been hearing a lot about fermentation in the alternative protein space in general. Are you using this technology now? And regardless, would you be able to give us just a very high level overview of of where fermentation could be used when it comes to new culture? Yeah, totally. We're using precision fermentation now. We have our own (laughs) in-house bioreactors that we grow our microbes in. And if you think about it, fermentation for cheese has been used for thousands of years, right? turning milk into cheese, especially for more mature and aged cheeses, you ferment the milk. And fermentation is essentially just utilizing a microbe to break down molecules and produce a desired byproduct. So we really use it twice. The first time we use it is with our engineered microbes, and we use fermentation to to grow them in this soup of carbon and, and nitrogen, and they produce our desired byproduct. And that byproduct is our target protein, our casein dairy protein. We recover that protein, we add our plant-based fats, plant-based sugars, and then we go through fermentation again effectively to turn this milk-like solution into our, our desired cheese. That's what we're doing. The important part, I guess, or the part that's the bottleneck and the big constraint to progress, bring costs down, getting volumes up, is the first fermentation, the precision fermentation, because you have to be able to produce a lot of your target protein to have any sort of impact that we want to have on global food sustainability. 
And so that requires you to produce your target protein via fermentation and larger vessels. And this is when everyone looks into cellular agriculture, everyone quickly understands that the key constraint is scale. And that scale is to do with driving down costs and driving up volumes with precision fermentation. As a question to a follow-up, and we discussed Perfect Day earlier, their process is totally different, right? I'm not sure. I can't comment. I know we're both making dairy proteins. Their first targets are the whey proteins. In cow's milk or in most mammalian milk, you have two protein fractions. You have whey protein, you have casein protein. Casein protein is used more for cheese making. And that's what we're targeting. And Perfect Day are targeting whey protein. And then they're making their ice cream and probably a bunch of other products with that. So fundamentally, both processes are fermentation. But the optimizations and the unit ops needed to produce whey versus casein are very different. Although we're both utilizing precision fermentation, my guess, because I don't know, you know, I haven't been inside their manufacturing facility, is that by targeting whey versus casein, you have to go through a pretty different process and how you go through the downstream processing, how you do product development and things such as that. Generally speaking, when we are talking about the technology that new culture is using, when we compare it to what we see in the cultured meat industry with scaling up tissue culture, would you say that scaling up what we're doing here with new culture, because it's a different technology, a technology that's been applied to other industries that have scaled, would you say that this is a technology that can scale a lot faster than, for example, what we're seeing in the cultured meat world? Yes, I think for the most part, that's correct. And we've seen evidence of that with like, Perfect Day again, who released their ice cream and they scaled up pretty quick in the grand scheme of things. With microbial fermentation or precision fermentation, as it's now called, there is a blueprint that's been set. This is, as you mentioned, this has been used for food for the last 30 or in 40 years. So there is a roadmap to scale. The key difference between what companies like our sales perfect day and, and other companies in the space are doing versus what happened decades ago and even still today is that the target molecules of proteins that we're making with precision fermentation are going to be a lot more used in our product. And what I mean by that is when we think about cheese, anywhere between 10 to 30% of cheese is protein. That means that when we use precision fermentation to make our protein, 10 to 30% of our final product is going to contain the output of that precision fermentation. And if precision fermentation is incredibly expensive to start off with, that's going to mean our cheese products can be incredibly expensive, which means that you have to drive down costs even more. If you think about what was used previously or other small molecules, preservatives, for example, they only represent maybe 0.1% or 0.5% of the composition of the final product. Meaning that although it may be very expensive to produce, as only a small fraction is going into each product, it's not really going to impact the price of the product that much. Whereas for us, as it's 10 to 20% or even 30%, we really have to drive down costs that much more to keep the overall cost of our products low, if that all makes sense. Okay, excellent. What is really the next stage of growth for the company? As you continue to develop the technology, what will the process of scale look like for your team and perhaps your facility? We are in the process of, of scaling our company. It's going to be a pretty exciting year this year as we look to close additional funding. With that, we are going to be scaling our team. We are going to be scaling fermentation. You have three scales, essentially. Pilot scale, which is hundreds of liters. Demonstration scale is about tens of thousands of liters. And commercial scale is hundreds of thousands of liters. And we want to get to demonstration scale, tens of thousands of liters by next year. And at the same time, we do want to start on the filing for grass or getting our protein and our product ready for market. And obviously with all this comes increasing the size of the team. So we're a team of just over 10 now, and we're going to look to grow that to actually over 30 in the next six to 12 months. So we are going to be going through a pretty big expansion in all areas. And that's really for us to scale our technology. When I think about the next stage of company for new culture or the next stage of growth, we're really building that bridge to commercialization. We've built the platform. Now let's cross it to commercialize. And that's what we're doing. That's definitely an exciting time and, and stage to be in for the startup. What kind of changes have you seen in the food technology industry in general? And I really ask this because being in the, in the Bay Area or in these food circles, we do really feel like there's a shift towards alternative proteins. Is it the bubble? Is it the food tech bubble? Or do you think that this is a wave that's actually taking place, not just nationally, but globally? 
I really do think it's taking place globally. I mean, obviously, specific regions and territories are doing it quicker, but it is happening in most places. And I think it's important to understand why. It's really understanding who's holding the purchasing power today. 10, 20 years ago, it was the baby boomers, and now it's the millennials. And what we're seeing globally is that millennials, like you and me, want more than just a tasty and cost-effective product. People are wanting other things. They want sustainability. They want nutritional and health benefits to the products that they're consuming. People, increasingly, people are wanting animal-free products. And this is a, a pretty significant trend that we already seen globally in industries such as fluid milk, where you have these plant-based milk, like almond milk and soy milk, taking larger and larger shares of the market, even at a cost that is on average 2x that of fluid dairy milk. So we're seeing this global shift in behavior due to a demographic change of who the largest consumers of food are. And for us, right, think about cheese. The biggest buyers of cheese are now millennials. And there's just this big demand, this big expectation for just something more, something more than what you can currently get in the store. And companies are reacting to that. And I think this trend will continue. I think there's a lot of kinks to work out in the system as it comes to supply chains. From the plant-based end, being able to supply enough plant-based protein to meet the increasing demands. A lot of that protein actually goes to animal farming, where it's going to start to have to be directed more to actually producing food products. And I think once companies like ourselves and especially companies on the meat side start scaling and getting that cost down where they can get to market, we'll see this trend accelerate because people will suddenly have additional options other than just either plants or animal-derived foods. They'll have this third option, cellular agriculture, which kind of is the best of both worlds. You get all the taste, textures, aromas that you want from animal-derived food, but you also get all the health and the sustainability and a lot of the clean label of plant-based foods. And so I can only see this, this shift increasing and accelerating, and I think we'll start seeing governmental shifts to this as well. You know, if you think about how much help industries such as dairy gets in the US, they get a huge amount of help in New Zealand. That's going to start to change because government's going to be aware that, hey, look, I can't keep propping up this house of cards in a way, which is causing damage to the environment. And actually, the demand is decreasing. And the US is buying millions of pounds of cheese to keep the price stable. And eventually, they're just going to have to say, look, guys, like this is a dying industry and we need to get with the times. We need to do this for the future of the planet. I'm hoping that's going to happen soon. It might take a bit longer, but I think overall, we're just going to see the shift or this change towards the animal-free future continue. Does New Culture plan to sell as a B2B ingredient, B2C under your own branded CPG product? Any plans for that at this stage? Yeah, so we like to think of ourselves as a product company and a branded product. So we do plan to sell our cheese co-branded at food service and branded at retail. And both approaches have merit in terms of B2C versus B2B. And I think it's important to understand that for any company using precision fermentation, for the first five years that you're commercializing, you're going to be making a pretty scarce product whether that is a protein you're selling as an ingredient or an actual fully fleshed out dairy product. And even though we'll be making hundreds of tons, in the world of dairy rights, that's microscopic. So the question we ask ourselves at New Culture is, what is the best value we can generate for the space or the product that we're creating for ourselves? And by being a product company, we can control the message, the story, the educational content to really make it a captivating, safe, exciting product category for consumers. And once we've done that, once we've really defined the space, show people what's possible, and once we get to the scales where we're like, hey, we can now really have an impact to not only sell products ourselves, but also to distribute our protein or our curd to other established players so they can start having and meeting their sustainability goals. And then we can start selling more as an ingredient. But I think it's, it's really important when you've got a scarce product to really define the space and control a lot of the ways that you do that. You can get in touch with Matt on LinkedIn and learn more about New Culture at www.newculturefood.com. Matt, do you have any last insights or advice for our listeners today? Yes, I do. So one of my favorite sayings is, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. So I think if 
you're looking to get into this space, if you're really interested, if you want to join a company working on this technology, just do it today. Like dive into it and learn as much as possible and go for it because this is a super exciting, super compelling, much needed technology and movement that we need all hands on deck. We need as much help as possible from all areas. And I think you'll quickly learn that you'll be welcomed by most companies by just having the passion, the perseverance to get yourself involved. I love it. Matt, thank you so much for being with us today and sharing your insights on the Future Food Show. Hey, thanks, Alex. It's been fun. This is your host, Alex, and we look forward to being with you on our next episode. This program was produced by H Media. We'll see you soon.